Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Transatlantic Trade Relations. Uh, before we begin, a few procedural points. At the end of the session, we'll hold a Q&A as time allows. You can ask questions through the Q&A function on the right of your screen. Those questions you pose will be visible only to you and the Flexport team. We will share a copy of the slide deck at the end of the presentation. All right, and now, to keep the lawyers happy, Please keep in mind that all information provided in this session is based on the situation at this current time and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. We always recommend reaching out to a Flexport expert to discuss your particular situation. Okay, identity check. Um, I'm Phil Levy, I'm Chief Economist at Flexport, and I'm thrilled that we have with us today Peter Chase, who's Senior Fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Peter has had a very distinguished career, including uh, as a U.S. diplomat with postings as Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs in the U.S. Mission to the European Union, Director of the State Department's Office of EU Affairs, Chief of Staff to the Undersecretary of Economic Affairs, and Counselor, Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs in the U.S. Embassy in London, as well as then putting forward all kinds of thoughtful ideas subsequent to that career. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Phil. I'm delighted to be here with you. All right. Why are we gathered here today? Um, well, the US-EU trade relationship is a very important one. That's been true for a long time. Um, we're talking about it today, though, as more than just a regular checkup. So within the last couple of months, there have been increasing tensions in the relationship and questions about maybe it needs some restructuring. And so that's what we're going to take on today. We're going to do that by looking at how we got here, how did this develop um, for the US-EU trade relationship, and maybe give you some statistics about just how big and significant it is. We'll talk a little bit about, to date, how have irritants been handled? Their you know, a trading relationship of the size, there's clearly going to be some points of disagreement. We we'll also have some very different approaches to things like you know, regulation in the past to, to state involvement and, and industrial policy. We're converging maybe a bit on that. We'll talk about it. Um, we'll, so we'll talk about what we've done in the past. We will then talk about the thing that really prompted this, which is the question, could the US and the EU have a free trade agreement with each other? Um, that actually came up, and I'll give you a couple quotes. Uh, it has come up in recent months from high-ranking US officials, partly as an interest in uh, expanding our trade policy, but also as a way of potentially addressing some irritants that are somewhat new on the scene. And then we'll conclude by talking about, all right, that's an idea, but what's really going to happen in transatlantic trade? Um, what do we see coming down the road? And we'll make sure to sort of touch on the question of, will companies actually notice a difference, or is this simply going to be um, things that have people flying back and forth across the Atlantic um, with, with minimal effect? Now, and then, time permitting, we will get to Q&A. Um, although we got a lot. So, what we're going to do first, though, is we are going to the poll. We're going to ask where you guys are all coming from on, on this, um, just to get started and to see what uh, what you're thinking. So what I'll ask you to vote on is this question, putting yourself in the position of respondent. Compared to 10 years ago, would you say that the US-EU trade relationship now is same old, same old, so no change, notably better than it was 10 years ago, notably worse than it was 10 years ago, but doesn't really make much difference, Notably worse than it was, and it will make a difference. Or, I don't know, you tell me. That's why I'm coming to your webinar. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for everyone who has voted on this. I see there's a lot of eager learners out there <laughs> who are curious about the state of relations. Um, beyond that, it looks like at least a plurality is saying that things are on a roughly even keel. Um, and, and very few thinking that the relationship is in trouble. Um, we're going to be covering all of this stuff, and we're going to be getting into detail. But Peter, if you had to sort of just give a broad introductory assessment, how would you vote on this? You know, I would say it's worse. And the reason I'd say it's worse is because you said 10 years ago. Hmm. 10 years ago, President Obama was uh, reelected. He had just had a State of the Union speech where he said the United States and Europe should, the European Union should negotiate a free trade agreement. Mm. And that was in, that was in January or February two, uh, 2013. And it's really interesting at that time, there was a lot of hope that in fact we could do a free trade agreement between us. 
So we're not there yet today. So in that case, we've just gone from, we're less hopeful than we were. Oh, fair point. And, and that was advisedly. I wanted to sort of, we've had a couple different administrations with maybe a different approach to trade. I wanted to sort of go back and take a farther <laughs> reference point that was deliberate, but I like your point. And we'll, we'll come to, uh, to the question of what this is actually going to mean in practice and whether that makes a difference that things are worse. All right. So why don't we move? Thank you, everyone, for voting. Um, we'll come back with a couple more polls as we as we move along. We, we appreciate your involvement. But let's talk about the the U.S. EU trade relationship. I wanted to sort of put a couple of facts out there just to anchor everyone in this. All of the uh, our beloved I don't know you tell me crowd. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And what I wanted to sort of point out, you know, a first just reference point is when you are talking about the U.S. and the EU, you are really talking about a very large fraction of the global economy. So this is using World Bank numbers, uh, world GDP shares from 2021. We've got the US in blue, uh, the EU in green. And what you see is together, this is what, 42% of, of world GDP. We could get into quibbles about whether you're using purchasing power parity or, or market things. I think this is market. Um, but in any case, indisputably, it is a large share of what's going on. So when the US and the EU do agree on what to do, you've got a, a large chunk of the global economy going along. I put in China and Japan as the next biggest participants. So if you're really trying to think about a degree of sort of coordination, you cover a fair bit of the economy when you get these two uh, economic entities together. By the way, I should note, and, and Peter, you can correct me on this, there's always a little bit of this awkwardness when we're talking about the US and the EU, do we talk about countries or economic entities? But how do you think about this, this is sort of the basics? The EU, it's obviously not one country, it's 27, but for trade purposes, should we be thinking of this as a unified entity? Yes. I mean, you really want to start me on this? No, I've, I've worked with the European Union directly since 1992. Um, so 30 plus 30 plus years. It is a trading entity. It's a member of the WTO. So I would I just refer to the European Union. Their internal trade is not perfect, but then again, it's not perfect in the United States either. And they have done an incredible job, just an incredible job, in terms of promoting trade among the 27 countries that make up the European Union. And the EU, I think, is the world's largest trader. If you add exports and imports together but that's with the rest of the world inside the eu so among the 27 the trade is two times what their work their trade is outside the eu which is a phenomenal thing if you think about the amount of movement goods and services going across the borders of the 27 member states of the eu just within that that grouping it's huge yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And I, I mostly do this to cover myself if I slip and start calling the EU a country. But I think the, the, the practical implication of this is if you are going to sit down and negotiate a trade policy with somebody, with you're negotiating with a single EU entity. There's not a French trade policy and a German trade policy and a Dutch trade policy. Well, that's like saying you're negotiating with the United States and not Joe Manchin. Or, <laughs> oh, okay, we'll get to that. Um, okay, yeah. so it's the di political <laughs> dynamics internally. I, I like they, analogy. They, That's right. So, so, sometimes you de facto are negotiating with a sub entity brand. Yes. Um, I like that. All right, cool. Some more statistics. Let's go to the next slide, please. And you were giving us some good information about how large these trading entities are relative to the world. I'm going to do this from a US perspective because I had the data at hand, but I think it works either way. And this is trying to put into perspective how important is the EU as a trading partner for the United States. So here we have three years of data put forward, 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, and this is for US import partners. These are the top five trading entities that are sort of import partners for the US. Um, you could break it down by, by sort of individual countries within the EU. I deliberately didn't, so we could sort of take them as a bundle here. But what you see is on this side, we'll do imports, and the next one, we'll do exports. But you see the EU, uh, for any given year you want to pick, 
is at the forefront as as the top partner when you sort of take it as collectively. So let's go to the next slide here, and that just has uh, that the next one should just be exports. So may, may or may not have labeled it correctly. Um, the point being, the EU is the top uh, is the top partner for this. Um, the next slide is one that I wanted to get us talking about, which is we. It seems so a little bit incongruous. It was such an important trading relationship. Why don't we have a free trade agreement? The point I want to get here, and I'll use to sort of launch and, and then turn the floor over to you a bit, Peter, and sort of how did we get here and, and, and where are we in terms of the broad relationship is the U.S. and the EU have been talking for a long time about trade and that frequently it was in the context of the general agreement on tariffs and trade um, and that you, you can see in this chart that proceeded with a whole series of rounds. The World Trade Organization is a very helpful site. Um, you know, initially that first round, the Geneva round, you had 23 participants, but the the negotiations themselves often started with a sort of core group, these quad countries, which had, if I remember correctly, it was U.S., EU, Canada, and Japan. Um, correct me if I got that wrong, but the uh, but so we've been talking for a long time. Is that a reasonable way to think about the relationship here? That that it was sort of they were talking, they were setting rules, but they ended up being global rules, and they were doing it through the GATT. It's that is how the United States and Europe always saw themselves as the as the founders, the creators, the guarantors of the global trading system, uh, which is of course based on the, the general agreement on tariffs and trade and then subsequently in the world trade organization all of those rounds that you're talking about it was always there was always a sense that it was the us versus the eu and the different trade differences between us that you know ultimately would get resolved in the context of the geneva talks um interestingly enough the last round of wto negotiations the doha round which was started directly after september 11th 9 11 um, the U.S. government called it the Doha Development Round because we wanted to respond to terrorism. We wanted to bring growth to everyone through trade, which was a great thing to do. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that the real dynamics of w the WTO negotiations then were actually among developing countries. It was Thailand looking at China, Mexico looking at China, Korea looking at China, India looking at China, and none of those countries wanting to open their their markets to the Chinese export juggernaut. And so the curious thing is that we became almost irrelevant in, not in our eyes, but actually in the real eyes of the negotiators behind the scene. Would you argue, tell me if I'm interpreting you correctly, that initially when you had the lower membership, the lower participation, often um, developing countries were given something of a pass early on with special and differential right. treatment that that cleared the way for a treatment of issues that were predominantly industrial country issues and often the big issues between the United States and the European Union. And as it broadened out and as developing country issues sort of came to the forefront, that changed. Is, is, that, the, uh, is that the takeaway? Essentially, yes. I mean, the, the, the thing that really changed was China as an export-oriented growth developing country not being subject, in fact, using special and differential treatment, so not being subject to the rules of the WTO the, the same way the industrial countries were. Would you, as we look over this time, but why don't you, I want to get a couple things in here as we sort of get what we want out of this section. Um, the first thing, would you say that this period worked reasonably well for, a, let's say, before the, the Uruguay round? Mm -hmm. Um, that it worked reasonably well for addressing U.S.-EU issues, even though it was actually a global agreement? Hmm. Before the Uruguay round? No, because the problem with the, the general agreement on tariffs and trade is the, our problems with the Europeans traditionally have been agriculture. Hmm. Whatever, the, whatever the thing is, it's agriculture or blowing Airbus. Uh, okay. Those were the pro those were the problems, and interestingly enough, in both areas, we don't have the same sort of investment-based relationship that we do uh, in every other aspect. 
the, the problem is you can't use a multilateral or a, a multilateral system to really resolve bilateral problems. Mm. Um, and I think that that's one reason why, going back to the, the earlier point, that the, the U.S. and Europe decided that they actually deserved to have a better bilateral relationship than just one based on multilateral rules. That there were things that they could do between them, that they should do between them, to allow for a deeper trading and investment relationship. Uh, interesting. Now, I want to pick up on one point. You, you, you nicely led into it. You mentioned that for a number of these areas, it wasn't just a trade relationship, it was an investment relationship. And you and I had talked about this a bit before the, or can you expound on that a little bit? What, you know, we talk about general agreement on tariffs and trade, a lot of people have this image of, well, what I want to be, uh, be facetious, I'll talk about, you know, the, the you know, tall masted sailing ships going forward with final goods. But your argument was that investment plays an important role. Where do we see that in the, in the US-EU relationship? Very something that look at the economic relationship, investment based relationship. The reason is you should that showed economies were so can hear. We're getting some audio difficulties, um, or at least I am. So, it's getting yeah, you're cutting out a little bit. Not sure which. Yeah, I don't know whether it's the headphones, but um, all right. Um, okay. Well, it, it, we're not getting the noise anymore. So let's uh, let's give it another go and see what we got. Investments. Very, very briefly, I mean, very few people actually think about the fact that. U.S. companies have invested over three trillion dollars into the European Union. Three trillion, and European companies have invested over two and a half trillion dollars in the entire economy. That don't even have with Canada, closest in many ways, our thing closest part because economies when there's Companies don't invest in the United States the way Europeans have. So we we trade a trillion, more than a trillion dollars a year between the United States and the European Union, even without the UK in it. And of that trade, of that trillion dollars of trade, almost 50, more than 50% is intra company. So it's between Siemens US and Siemens Germany or uh, Alstom or choose your company. And the, a large amount of the goods going and services going back and forth across the, the Atlantic are within a single company. They're in, it's an integrated operational relationship that we have at the corporate level between us. Totally different from a relationship that we have in Canada or any others. And it's that uniqueness is something that I think people miss. Um, and because they miss it, they also don't really think about how they should best, how important it is actually that we have a good trading relationship with the European Union. So is it possible to separate out and say, you know, this share of our difficulties are trade difficulties and this share are investment difficulties, or are they inextricably linked? No, the, dif the difficulties we have, as I said, even today are largely in agriculture. Okay. You could argue about Boeing, Airbus, and in that area, in neither of those sectors, do we have a lot of investment. So all of our investment is in the, the services and manufacturing areas. And in general, services and manufacturing trade between the United States and Europe is excellent, even though it's on a most favored nation basis, that is on the, the WTO rules, rather than on a special bilateral agreement. Okay, so we've, we've led ourselves right to where we wanted to be, which is to talk a little bit about <laughs> disputes and, and irritants and how they're handled. We're going to give the audience a chance to weigh in again um, and think about, you've already proposed some candidates here, but we wanted to talk about what are the, the key irritants in, in the U.S.-EU trade relations. Um, so here are your choices. Um, 
And if I've left out your favorite, then you can uh, write about it in the questions. Uh, one, Section 232, aluminum and steel restrictions. This is sort of with the national security basis for imposing restrictions that started under President Trump. Um, Two, and I've lumped some things together here, subsidies, including large passenger aircraft. You made reference to Boeing Airbus. Um, at least one version of that is that this is a dispute about subsidies and, and state aid. Um, three, the Inflation Reduction Act and Buy American Rules. Um, and then four, agriculture, chlorinated chickens and GMOs. Uh, so thank you for those of you who have voted. Wow, we've got a pretty even distribution. Oh, no, no, wait, it's gonna help the Inflation Reduction Act well, okay, so now you all know why we're meeting, because that was part of the, the prompt. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you you were, you were saying, Peter, this, this is great. We very much appreciate the inputs. You were saying that, that you thought that it was primarily things like agriculture. We have agriculture sort of burbling along there, but clearly we've had a lot of other stuff in the news. Um, what would you, we'll, we'll talk about irritants in general, but if you were, again, going after this one, and you, by the way, you as our guest are free to pick something else if you want to. Top irritant um, right now in the US and the EU on the trade front. The top irritant right now is Buy American Policies. Okay. That was a top irritant as well in, in TTIP. By the way, um, the one thing you didn't actually mention when you were doing my, my bio, and I think it's important for folks to know. After I retired from the State Department, I worked for six and a half years as the representative of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Europe. Uh, and it was during that time that we were negotiating a free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union. So I'm deeply engaged in that. But right now, the issue is, is of course, the IRA and Buy America, that, which arguably is not a quote-unquote trade irritant, in the sense that as long as the United States does not violate its commitments under the WTO's government procurement agreement, then it's not, what we're doing is legal. The problem is all countries in the WTO decided that government procurement, spending your citizens' taxpayer dollars is different from normal procurement between uh, two parties, uh, private parties. So the rules for government procurement are different, and the Biden administration and the Trump administration before, but this is an ongoing thing, the United States really does like to do Buy America provisions. When you, you know, spend, are spending taxpayer dollars, you want to spend a lot of it on American steel. I'm not sure that's good for American taxpayers, but that's a different issue. Is there an EU equivalent to this? I mean, when we think about, say, the consortium of, of, of Airbus, I don't know that they're, I don't know how much they're sourcing things, you know, sort of globally as opposed to dividing them up among member countries. You know, one of the things that's really special about the European Union is that the, the European Union exists to end war. And I, and I say that because it's really important. It's so deeply in the ethos and that the ethos is all, if you free up economic relations among countries, you won't, you won't have war among them. And that's, that goes to a lot of things. So government procurement, for instance, is fully regulated under EU rules. And among the 27 countries, they may not do anything that discriminates for their local for their local industries it's against the law and there are even ways to there are even ways to fight against it the, of course there is discrimination it's you no know, it's a little bit not necessarily under the table but it's when you kind of direct the specifications for a contract a little bit or someone who's closer but all of their bids are online there it's um it's all open and because they do it internally they actually are pretty open externally. So in the government procurement agreement, they have very few things where they take exceptions where they will only buy locally. And it's it's an interest, it's one of their main complaints about us. The US government and you know I when I was doing this stuff, we would argue that in the EU you found more de facto discrimination, whereas in the United States it was more de jure. When you're talking about discrimination, a, you're talking about discrimination between what entities? Uh, uh, foreign, foreign suppliers. Okay. So 
so I, if I'm building a water purification plant, is the equipment for that water purification plant imported or is it made domestically? Is there a requirement that it be made domestically? And again, in the EU, in the US, we will tend to say that's a water purification plant. It's being built with government, you know, citizens, taxpayers, dollars. We want it to go to American suppliers. Uh, in the EU, they'll say it can go to any supplier. But yeah, for some reason, it doesn't. So the, the yeah. post facto, you see that a lot of things in the EU are procured locally, but that's not because of the law, the legal system. How serious is this dispute over the Inflation Reduction Act? I mean, you saw some fairly high level movement. Is this just, you know, normal course of business or something worth worrying about? Um, the Europeans got very concerned, but I think the Biden administration has actually done a very good job addressing some of the key questions, which are particularly electric vehicles, the question of electric vehicles and how much of that needed to be domestically made or NAFTA made. Um, and, you know, not NAFTA. But USMCA. What do, what do we call it now? <laughs> yeah, I, USMCA. I'm sorry, I'm dating myself. Um, uh, that requirement, the domestic content requirement that was written in was for the, in order to benefit from a tax, uh, credit for buying an electric vehicle. That's not government procurement. Okay. So taken from what you've been saying, and I, I do apologize for the technical difficulties for everyone that we've been having, um, is that you're, you're, you're saying this has to do more perhaps to, it, you didn't say the word sexy, but this is a sexy thing making, you know, batteries for, for electric vehicles and, and being involved in the sort of new emerging green sector. And that it, it's maybe more symbolic perhaps than it is uh, actually sort of financially important. Is, is that a fair paraphrase of what you were saying? Okay, now I think I've lost, we've lost your sound altogether. Um, so um, I wanted to, so one of the things that I wanted to do is um, let's talk about, so this is of course one of the things that's prompting us to, to sort of have this discussion. Um, when, let's, so actually I'm going to ask two questions in a row. One of them is you mentioned that we, there is an exception made in the Inflation Reduction Act for, for Mexico and Canada, for the USMCA partners, the agreement formerly known as NAFTA. Um, the, should we be thinking differently about U.S. North American trading partners than we are with sort of transatlantic trading partners? I mean, it's clearly de facto, it's there in, in the law. Is that, do you think that's appropriate? The, the question on the table was, should we be thinking differently, sort of, U.S. commercial policy, foreign policy, about North American partners versus transatlantic partners. Okay, so so it's important. This is an important detail in the Inflation Reduction Act. Mr. Manchin, Senator Manchin, said domestic content or content from our free trade agreement partners. Someone later, when he was at Davos in January, someone said, "You realize that this is a real problem for the European Union," and he said, "Why?" And then he said, oh, I didn't know we didn't have a free trade agreement with Europe. Yeah. Which is, you know, so it was not the intent of the author of the domestic content requirements to completely screw the Europeans. It was just you know, sloppy drafting. Oops. And that gives, that gives a little bit of political wiggle room for the administration to do things that, that address the problem of the domestic content requirements. But I have to add one additional thing that's very important. The European real concern is not just the provisions of the law that discriminate against European auto suppliers. The real European concern is that, you know what, fossil fuels and energy in the United States are really cheap relative to Europe. And there is a sense of the, the Inflation Reduction Act with all of the investment that it's, it, it's directing towards the U.S. economy 
the Europeans are a little bit concerned that they are going to be using com losing competitiveness more globally uh, in the manufacturing area uh, to the United States. And you know, that's, that's something that the Biden administration can't help the Europeans with. The only people who can help the Europeans with that one is the Europeans themselves. Um, and that's one of the things they're talking about now, about how they change their whole electricity supply market, which is a, a big deal because it's all predicated on the, the price of gasoline, uh, of natural gas. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. This is sort of serving as a bit of a proxy for, for other concerns. Correct. Interesting. Um, before we get to, you know, you, you hit uh, on exactly what's at the core of this, with this idea that you're just fine, you know, whether it's a proxy or not, you're just fine on the electric vehicles if you are a free trade agreement partner, which is part of what has then spurred some of this discussion. Before we get to that, I just wanted to get your take, and I know you were um, heavily involved in a lot of this. Um, we talked about, well, the GATT as a forum for, you know, w which were more or less well for addressing USDU concerns. Um, I just wanted to get a quick take from you on the other venues that have been more prominent, say, in the last 20 years, for where could issues be taken up, whether it is the WTO, which emerged out of the Uruguay Round, whether it is bilateral negotiations, and I believe there have been a whole series of, it's come in different forms, but bilateral talks between the US and the EU, or portilateral things. We saw, like, in the wake of the global financial crisis, a G20 statement about what should be done how would you assess the, the relative the relative efficacy of those different approaches for handling US EU issues? I hate to say this to you, Phil, but they all play their own different roles. And they're they you can't say that one is a better tool unless you're talking about a specific problem. And depending okay. on what the problem is, a different a, a, a different venue might be best. WTO rules and International trade rules have been a good good place to do it. The United States, I, for reasons that the, I simply cannot understand, we, the United States, who created an international trading system, we're the ones who have effectively defanged it. It's now useless by uh, essentially killing the dispute settlement function, which was the key thing that we did in the WTO work around negotiations. Uh, you know, take it up with Mr. Trump or and the current administration, which is neither of which is doing anything to improve that. Bilateral negotiations, there are every issue between two countries needs bilateral negotiations. Those are always there. Um, sometimes they're more effective than others. Hopefully you don't, you know, we've had an ongoing dispute with the European Union about, about uh, genetic modified organizations, organisms forever. Uh, they're, still being part of a, a, a bilateral negotiation. Plurilateral, I personally think the G7, rather than the G8, that the G7 is in fact a key place for the United States, Europe, and Japan, going back to that pie chart that we should use that, because the G7 is essentially United States, Canada, Europe. For them to together to provide a basis and a general agreement on international laws and international frameworks, but that G7 is actually extremely good for a lot of things in that. It, even if it doesn't make law, it creates the caucus of like-minded countries that will strive to build the law that, that we need. Um, oh, same with the OECD, which provides a lot of the intellectual input to it. All of those are really good things, but I think that the United States and Europe. They, we have an excellent, excellent economic relationship, investment based, but it could be a lot better. It could be a lot better. It should be better. It would be better for us and our companies in dealing with the competitive, competitive problems we have, we face with China. I mean, it seems to me an easy one. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and just as background for those who haven't followed it as closely, you, you make an excellent point about the dispute settlement where normally this would have been a venue because often, you know, in general, WTO dispute settlement cases were one country thinking that the other hasn't followed the rules, which could be on something like government procurement. What we've had is an impasse with the, with the European Union, um, largely I think it's a US-EU issue, Oh, you disagree? Okay, you get your, your turn in a second. So I'll put out the hypothesis and I'll let you, but this has something to do with sort of the way 
you develop things through sort of case law versus legislating, and there was an argument about this, which meant that it came down to would you pointing anybody to the appellate body? And as soon as we fell under below the critical level of, uh, of people on the appellate body, all of a sudden you could effectively kill any dispute by saying, I'll refer it to the appellate body, and then the appellate body doesn't exist, so it goes off into the void, or at least it sits in, in suspension. Um, but, what, but you have a different take. You don't think this is largely a U.S.-EU issue about how dispute no. settlement works? No, this is, this is a U.S. It's almost specifically a Bob Lighthizer, the former U.S. trade representative under the Trump administration issue. It was a problem a little bit, a little bit, during the Obama administration. But this, I, unless people really want to get into the depths of WTO dispute settlement uh, issues, we might. Yeah, fair but, enough. We'll park that. Park that. Fair enough. Um, all right, let's move on to talk about the, the sort of headline subject, which is could the US and the EU have a free trade agreement? I think we've got, um, let me see here. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, actually. And this is the, the quote that you've already mentioned that we had coming up, uh, Senator Manchin saying, and I believe you're right, there's a Davos is the context, did not realize the EU is not a free trade agreement nation. So therefore this unwitting effect coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act. But then we also had Treasury Secretary Yellen saying we don't have something with Europe and Japan that we consider right now to be a free trade agreement, but we could negotiate one. So that's what I want us to turn to now is really, can we? Um, and I think our next slide will have uh, some of the sort of considerations and obstacles, but let me just offer it to you as a free form thing what do you think about the idea? You've been, in, as you said, you were involved in a lot of these discussions. And, and it's, as you also noted, not the first time anybody's talked about this. We had the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, is, 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 people aren't doing it at the moment. Is it doable? So going back to my opening comment, um, you know, in February 2013, President Obama, Obama said the United States wants to negotiate a free trade agreement, a very, very bold and ambitious free trade agreement with the European Union. That was the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. We started the negotiations of June 20, 20, 2013, did a lot of work up until the, you know, the time when um, Mr. Obama had to leave office and Mr. Trump came into office. And that basically ended the negotiations then. But, but during the time of the negotiations, TTIP was extremely politically debated, hotly debated in Europe in particular, because, and this is important, we were trying to negotiate an agreement that didn't only lower trade barriers and lower investment barriers, because between the United States and Europe, those actual barriers aren't really as significant. I mean, we have $1.1 trillion worth of goods and services trade every year. So, you know, that's not nothing. But we wanted to make it better, and we wanted to make it better in part by looking at regulatory areas and where we could make our regulations more compatible. And for many Europeans, they thought, there was the impression, that somehow TTIP was going to undermine the European regulatory environment. And that was something that created a tremendous political backlash against the negotiations. In retrospect, in retrospect, um, I would say that this was a time of a lot of disinformation going on in the in social media and things like that that we did not understand until after the 2016 elections, when we got a better understanding of how social media can be used to whip off political discontent, or at least to appear to whip it off. So whether the debate was a real debate or a manufactured debate, I don't know. I talked to, I spent a lot of time as a representative of American business talking to Europeans. Um, I could tell that they were concerned. I didn't, don't think their concerns were justified, but it was because of the regulatory issues that um, TTIP, I think, Failed. It did not get done in the time that the USTR at the time, Mr. Froman, thought it should, could and should do. Yeah, I, re I recall there was a, a lot of uh, people sort of knew going into this, this was going to be challenging. That was the whole, you know, let, can we get it done on one tank of gas kind of idea that there might be sort of 
if, if you really have to cut through a lot of regulatory thickets, this may take a while. I, I'm interested that you're sort of more optimistic about this. And let's, you, you've already sort of mentioned that agriculture is often at the heart of this. How does one finesse that if, if you think this is doable? And, and it does get down to regulatory things such as can you use genetically modified organisms in, in crops? We've got a picture of crops here for this to, to visualize. But how could that be finessed? Or is this sort of an interminable shouting match? You know, all of, all of the econometric studies that we've had showed that you'd get a lot of the, the big bang for the buck in a US EU trade agreement would be on regulatory cooperation. But, and this is the important thing, but just getting rid of tariffs would actually have a big impact on trade between us. Um, and there was an original study that, that was part of launching the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership negotiations that showed you know, about $18 billion of additional, 18% increase in exports both ways, if I remember correctly, just by getting rid of all traditional barriers to trade. I'd have to, it's been a long time since I read it, so I'd have to, I'd have to check my statistics. I think here um, we could do something that separates out the regulatory issues and lets the regulators handle them, just as happened, if you think about it, just as happened during COVID, where the US drug approval of their, the FDA in the European uh, European Medical Agency were actually talking all the time about what would be allowed and safe and how we would allow it. That sort of regulator regulator cooperation can be extremely effective. It doesn't need to be included in a trade agreement. Okay, so you can sort of channel things in an appropriate way or sort of table them, effectively tabling for, for, for future discussion or for a different dialogue and, and then take the benefits of the, of the tariff liberalization. That's your argument? That is correct. And actually, what I'm going to do right here, because to pick up on your point about tariffs, I'm going to take one of our audience questions a little bit early, because it's, it's very apropos, um, which is noting that, oddly, you know, I think we, we had had the lead-in to, to all of this was sort of steadily descending tariffs. We've actually had increasing tariffs, at least sort of if you look at like steel and aluminum. Um, where we, we've got a deal. So presumably, whatever benefits you were seeing before, um, there's there's more to this. Um, do you think, where would you count this issue with the sort of trade in steel and aluminum? Is it, because it had this, well, not a tinge, it was explicitly based on national security considerations. Is this the kind of thing that one would route off into future discussion, or would this be right at the core of you know, we're a free trade partner, you can't do this, you can't either slap tariffs or tariff rate quotas on us. The, the decision by Mr. Trump's U.S. Trade Representative to, to rely on national security to, to impose punitive tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum was I think kind of a last gasp attempt to protect those domestic industries because we had tried before under the George W. Bush administration uh, using safeguard agreements and uh, using safeguard clauses and had lost a WTO case about it, you know, as it happens. I think it was a serious mistake to use national security. That's me. I think that the, it was a misdiagnosis of the problem it did definitely get the Europeans really pissed off because they say, we're your NATO allies. How, how dare you say that for a national security thing, you can't buy our steel. Now, when, when Mr. Biden became president, this particular dispute was not resolved. It was shelved. It was basically, we said, okay, well, we won't charge those tariffs, but we'll put a quota on you. And it's a very difficult, quota to administer. Your people in, in this webinar probably deal a lot with things like this, uh, and it's horrible uh, administratively. And we're in the middle of a war, you know, that both we as NATO 
countries are actually trying to help support the Ukrainians. One could wonder whether or not this is actually a smart way of doing it. So I think that the, the, the problem is the steel and aluminum issue is still there. It's still live. It could still come back. Um, and it's still creating troubles. Hopefully at some point in time, someone will say that this is not good for the United States. Never mind for anyone else, that it's not good for the United States. Uh, would be, I think, of useful for us and for uh, American workers as well. Yeah, okay. It's point. All right, so we're going to get in a minute to how this is all, you know, how this is all going to play out and, and what, what your crystal ball shows. Before we do, though, we're going to ask the audience um, to to weigh in on, on one last poll and tell us what they're expecting. So we started by looking back. We're going to conclude by looking forward. Um, so let me ask you all out there who waited so patiently, um, do you expect that the U.S. and the EU will address their differences in the next few years, a little bit vague about this, by muddling along pretty much as they are now, reaching new agreements under the WTO, reaching new bilateral deals, but something short of an FTA, maybe the kind of thing you, you do in sort of a bilateral discussion, agreeing on, an, on a new FTA, or just letting things get worse uh, with, with sort of more impediments to trade? Okay, let's see what we're getting in. Thank you all for voting. Um, it looks like, oh, it's actually kind of a, a neck and neck race, but at the moment I'm seeing a plurality for reaching new bilateral deals, but not an FTA. And maybe these people were picking up on one of the, there was a little bit of a suggestion perhaps in Secretary Yellen's comment of something that could be interpreted um, where this doesn't necessarily have to be something of the magnitude of USMCA, but might be something um, in between. All right, thank you all for voting. Uh, by the way, I would note a fairly small percentage actually sees a new FTA on the horizon. Why don't we start there? You just sort of laid out the case that there, there is a path, this has been tried, and that one might do this if one is diplomatic and smart about the whole thing. For, for how one gets there. What odds are you putting, Peter, on an FTA between the US and the EU? In the next five years? Sure. Mm, say 2.5%. Very precise, I like it. Um, <laughs> I won't ask you about your error bands. Um, the, so, so this is not sort of around the corner as a solution to the no. In Inflation Reduction Act. No, there are ways to resolve the Inflation Reduction Act issues. They're, they're working on it. But you have to understand that the Biden administration has no interest in trade liberalization. And what the United States and Europe are doing now, and you've referred to the trade and technology company, what we're doing now has nothing to do with addressing irritant trade between us. As such, the Trade and Technology Council was modeled on something that we did actually with the Europeans during George W. Bush's administration, the Transatlantic Economic Council of 2007, which interestingly enough started with a big strategic discussion about how the United States and Europe should deal with China. That was in 2007. <clears throat> Muddling along, I think, is what it seems to me of what we've been doing for 15 years. It's not not as good as we, we might have been able to do. Um, so I think that there are, there's all these things to, for two huge economies to do, to improve things. Again, there, there is work being done by regulators. There's, you know, there are problems that we have in, in terms of data flows between us, largely due to European laws that are, are debatable. <laughs> you know, and since we're now talking about services trade is so fundamentally important to us and services trade is based on is digitally enabled if you want to put it that way so when you have problems on data flows you've got you've got serious problems we think the united states and in europe have agreed something that should resolve this at least for now 
it will go to the European Court of Justice for another ruling. Hopefully the European justices will be a little bit more realistic than they have been in their previous rulings. So there are things that we can do and that are being done. It's just, it will be piecemeal. It will be in item by item, which becomes very, the whole idea of doing a trade agreement is how many things can I get done more quickly? And if we've chosen to do it more labor intensive approach, that's what we'll do. But it's basically related to the fact that this administration does not want to open the, uh, open the US economy to, further to imports and specifically not imports from China. So th that's interesting the way you put this and what it sort of comes to mind is there's a couple, when we talk about a free trade agreement, there's a couple or, or some negotiated commercial deal. There's a couple different dimensions we can think in. One, you know, what degree of animosity is there between the participants? So maybe we sort of make things peaceful. The other is how much liberalization did you actually achieve? And those don't have to go together. You can have an amicable thing, and one can argue that maybe this is what happened under the Biden administration with Section 232, an amicable resolution which did not liberalize trade. It was just kind of an agreement not to. So I, I, I hear you saying that you think things will be reasonably amicable. We won't be having sort of big dispute flare-ups between the U.S. and the EU. Where do you come out on the spectrum of more liberal versus more open versus um, more restricted trade? Both. Both the United States and Europe are, be, are much more defensive on trade than we like to think of ourselves as having been. Okay. That's a rather weird construct, but it's a little bit our, our myth of, you know, both the United States and Europe have these myths of being very, very open. And they are, we are I, we're hugely open on the one hand. But that doesn't mean we don't have places we, where we, in fact, are not as open as all that. Um, that's just in general, and it's also true between between us. Um, the Europeans are spending a lot of time talking about, you know, the need for European economic sovereignty. Um, there's a, their concern about the relative competitiveness of the United States. Everyone is concerned about China, and everyone is adopting measures, ostensibly. Well, maybe even actually to deal with the problem of China's export capacity or over investment in capacity. But these, these measures, these tools can also be used against our allies. And sometimes they are. And that was exactly what was happening at 232. The 232 of steel and aluminum was a, the problem was China's over, you know, over investment in steel and aluminum capacity. The solution was to hit everyone over the head, which you know generally is not what I would say is a smart approach, but that's that's what happened. And I think that that we have to be careful, the United States and Europe, that we don't, in our defensiveness, actually do things that screw things up for ourselves, um, including by doing something that places stress on the investment-based relationship between the United States and Europe, because we will be clearly, I mean, a good economist will say you block imports, you're not doing yourself any favors, right? In this case, you're shooting your own company in the foot because they have operations in Europe that are integrated with their operations in the United States. So it's, it's even more um, dubious questionable as to whether or not that sort of policy option is a good one. And I think that I'm, I'm afraid sometimes that people like Mr. Manchin write laws, not realizing that you know, we don't have a trade agreement with Europe. So you know, hopefully people will become more aware. Hopefully they will be thinking about whether or not what they're doing is good for the United States and good for American workers. Building the relationship with Europe clearly is a good thing for Europe. For our companies and our workers. All right. Well, th an excellent way to wrap up because you got some some wisdom in there and some hope even at the end. <laughs> so, Peter, thank you very much for sharing all your 
all your sort of insight and experience on this. Very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all to the audience for attending today's session. Um, we will email out the slides and a link to this recording tomorrow morning. Uh, there will also be a short feedback survey presented when you log off the call. Um, please do take a moment to share your thoughts and feedback with the team so we can continue to curate content for you. Um, thanks again to you all and please have a great day. Thank you very much, Bill. Take care.